Now, no discussion of predestination or election would be complete without an understanding of Arminianism and Calvinism. We've already given you the definitions of those two. And tonight we'll look at the five points which are best remembered by the word tulip. Tulip, which uh, stands for, well, any book that deals with it, like uh, I have here the Reform Doctrine of Predestination by Boynton, and uh, I dare say he'll have them in that order. Yeah, the five points of Calvinism in section two of his book. That's total inability, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. That's what TULIP stands for. It's the easiest way to remember it. Now, we'll look at these one by one. I'll read a section from the Westminster Confession, which is... Uh, Calvinistic Confession uh, by the Presbyterian Reformed Church, or churches, we should say. In fact, up until last century, or the early part of this century, most churches were Calvinistic, even the Church of England. So we'll read from one of the confessions that's the best known, which is the Westminster, then we'll give the Arminian objection, then we'll look at some scripture. Now, we've covered, really covered most of this, but not in the sense of looking at them in the logical way in which Calvin deals with them. And we're primarily concerned here with a special election, our special predestination, which is election. All right, total inability. Now, I'll just give a quote from a Westminster Confession on this. Now, you don't have to write this. This will just tell you what uh, the confession of faith uh, stated. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, has wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether adverse from good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto which, of course, is what we've already seen the Bible says. Now, the Arminian, in uh, reply to that, or his point of view, Arminianism holds to two or three things along this uh, line of ability. First of all, that man is not dead in sin, but spiritually sick. He's not really dead, he's just spiritually sick. And he needs grace only to assist him to assist his own efforts in turning from sin to God. Or, to state it, summarize it, man cooperates with grace in salvation. Now, as we said before a couple of times, we're not teaching Calvinism here or the five points, but as I say, this is a charismatic school and no study would be complete without at least knowing what the five points are. And uh, obviously, if I had to choose, I'd have no hesitation in choosing. If I had to be a Calvinist and Arminian, I, I would be a Calvinist. <laughs> but I don't have to be the one if I just follow the word. I'll, I'll come, up, come out on election and predestination, essentially where Calvin did. Now, we've already mentioned such terms as hyper-Calvinism, which is not Calvinism, and so forth. So we're not talking about that. So that would be the Arminian view, that man cooperates with God or with grace in his salvation. That he isn't dead in sins and trespasses, but he is spiritually sick and he needs help. Well, of course, we already know the scripture reply to that, but we'll remind ourselves again since we're on the subject. Ephesians 2.1 says we are, were rather, dead in sins and trespasses. You has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And the Bible always presents us in our unregenerate state as dead and unable to help ourselves. Uh, another passage is uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 8, and 9, for by grace are you saved and not of works. So there's no cooperation in Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians. 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It's by grace you're saved. And remember, it's grace. You're not saved by faith. You're saved by grace. The means is faith. But you couldn't be saved by faith if that's all there was. There has to be the bestowal of saving grace upon you. And he says that even the faith you believe with, that is also God's gift. That's a part of the gift of grace. Now let's say what the Bible says. We hear a lot of emphasis, you're saved by faith, and it's all right as long as you're not trying to be theological. But when you get technical and biblical, then you have to say it the way the Bible says, you're saved by grace. And men and women are not taught today they're saved by grace, they're saved by uh, something they do. Repentance or exercising faith or going to an altar or joining a church or getting baptized. But it's all grace in the Bible. So don't be afraid to say what God says. By grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works either, lest any man should boast. Uh, even the faith is a gift. Then it's not of works, lest any man should boast. So, And then of 1 Corinthians 2.14, all of these passages we've looked at in other connections, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, they are spiritually discerned. So in our natural state, as Calvin said, the Scriptures agree with what he said. Or let's turn around, he agreed with the Scriptures. We're just simply trying to see uh, which side, the Arminian or Calvinistic side, the Scriptures will side in with. Which view, I mean, it would side in with. And the scriptures unhesitatingly show us that man lacks ability to save himself. It is total inability. Before I ever uh, read into Calvin's Institutes, I preached total inability. I just thought that that's what you were supposed to do because the Bible taught it. Romans 3 teaches total inability. Oh, so many passages we've already looked at, but these are just quick reminders. Romans 3, uh, 10 to 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They've all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Verse 19, all the world is guilty before God. Verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But verses 10 to 12 said that there's none who has any knowledge, spiritual knowledge, discernment, understanding. None seeks God. We've all uh, gone out of the way. We're all together unprofitable. In other words, God, in effect, is saying here, if it wasn't for redemption, he wasted his time in making us. We have shown no profit. We're unprofitable. And we've shown no spiritual profit. We could spend an hour just quoting scriptures that, that confirm inability. And uh, I think we've already proven before we ever got to the five points in this study of predestination and election that man is unable without grace. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Isaiah 53. The wicked go astray as soon as they're born, speaking lies. Proverbs 58.3. I just, these just come to mind, you know, that state that it's uh, inability on our part. Then the second uh, point is uh, unconditional election. Even those who believe, say they believe in election, do not always believe in unconditional election, but it's unconditional election. So I'll read from Westminster Confession again. Now, the confessions of faith always state things very precisely and uh, academically and sometimes rather bluntly without trying to explain them. And then they, the rest of the chapter explains it. By the decree of God, we're talking about unconditional election. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated to everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. Those of mankind that are predestinated unto life, God before the foundation of the world was laid according to his eternal and immutable purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will has chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory 
out of his mere grace and love without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance in either of them or any other thing in the creature as conditions or causes moving him thereunto and all to the praise of his glorious grace. Well, if you followed that, uh, it's a long sentence, but uh, it's what we've shown over and over in the Bible. As God has appointed the elect unto glory, so hath he by the eternal and most free purpose of his will foreordained all the means thereunto, whereby they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his Spirit, working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith into salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, saved, but the elect only. Now those are Calvinistic statements of faith. Uh, we don't get up and make statements of faith like that. We just simply, as we're in the Word, we see what the Bible teaches about predestination, election, and so forth. Now, statements like that do not bother me in the least, but a person who has no training in the Word and in these deeper truths that are taught from Genesis to Revelation uh, would start raising questions right away about certain statements there. Um, one, I would even question myself the way it's stated in the first paragraph, that... Uh, it would need explanation. But anyway, that we're looking at the Calvinistic doctrine. Westminster Confession is the best expression of that. Now, the Arminian reply to unconditional election, the basic tenets of Arminianism is God foresaw, God foresaw who would believe, and he elected these before the foundation of the world. He looked down through history and foresaw all who would believe and elected them. They were ordained to eternal life before the foundation of the world because he foresaw they would believe. They were ordained to eternal life because he saw they would believe. But what saith the scripture? Because they were ordained to eternal life, they believe. See, it's just the reverse. Arminianism has absolutely no basis in scripture. I mean, it's, uh, uh, they couldn't even read the Bible and get some of the statements they have in their creeds. They say the sinner was ordained, or the elect was ordained to eternal life because God saw he would believe. The Bible says, Acts 13, 48, because he was ordained before the world, he would believe. You see, the ordination came before the believing. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. It says as many. It didn't say all, and all didn't, if you read the passage. Most of them opposed. And so Paul's statement, or Luke's statement there was in the book of Acts, well, some did believe. How many? As many as were ordained to eternal life. There are areas of <clears throat> predestination and election that... Uh, just goes beyond the human mind to grasp. Uh, so there's some things you may never reconcile, like Romans 9, where God says, he has mercy upon whom he ha will have mercy, hardens whom he wills. But as you study the whole revelation, and he put it in here to be studied, he's revealed enough that we can learn enough as much as we need to know. Before we get done the study, you'll come to see it isn't arbitrary, uh, if you haven't already seen it. It isn't arbitrary, and that it's, um, well, that's the best place to leave. It isn't arbitrary that he, uh, see, Calvinism teaches that, that Christ died for the elect only. Uh, Calvinism does. Now, I don't get up and preach that, you see, because that isn't the way the Bible states it. In actual practice or effect, that's what happens. And so... Uh, God didn't send us to preach Calvinism, but when we get the whole revelation before us, you'll see the way God did it at Calvary is, makes sense and it's biblical. And uh, you'll end up where the Calvinist does as far as election and predestination is concerned, but you will be scriptural in doing it and not, uh, not be uh, stating things differently than the Bible does. Well, anyway... That's what the Bible says, Acts 13, 48, reverses Arminianism. 
and then 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 with 2 Timothy 1, 9 shows its unconditional election. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14 with 2 Timothy 1, 9, its unconditional election. Not conditioned on man believing, man working, man doing anything. Election is just that. If it's not unconditional, it is an election. It's based upon works or something else. What God foresees we will do, if even if he foresees we would believe, then that's works. See, it's something we're going to do that conditions him to elect us. But it's unconditional. Second Thessalonians 2, 13, 14. We're bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, wherein too he has called you by our gospel to the obtaining of this salvation. Now this says God from the beginning has chosen us to salvation by our believing the truth. Now take that fact and that's right. It doesn't say God foresaw we believe, but you need another scripture with that to clarify what we have said that it's unconditional. Second Timothy 1.9 God has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. You see you need all of scripture. You can take a verse and prove your side. You could, uh, you could quote 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, 14. Uh, our men could quote it. Say, see, it's conditioned on their believing. It isn't conditioned on their believing, but election is, is election unto our responding to the call. And we know we're elect if we respond. If we don't respond, then that's also a notice. But it's our responsibility. So election has to be unconditional, we're saying. The Bible says. Why? Because somebody has to get the glory and salvation. It's either going to be God or the sinner. And the Bible from cover to cover says it's by grace and by faith and not of works. Well then, how could it be by works way back before the world was created and you were ever heard of or born? If it's election, it has to be unconditional. Ephesians 1, again, uh, states that very fact, that it was unconditional. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. What's the purpose? Somebody's going to get praise and glory out of election. What's, why did he choose us to be to the praise of the glory of his grace? Amen. That free grace he gives those that he's chosen and called. And then Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells you what he's talking about there. By grace are you saved. Through faith, and even that's God's gift, right. not of works. Romans 4 states this fact. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father has pertaining to the flesh hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. In other words, if any works enter into it, then we would be glory. Oh, God looked down through eternity and saw I would believe, and that's why he chose me. He saw my heart. He saw I wouldn't be as bad as the rest, and I would straighten up when I heard the gospel. And It's, it's works from beginning to end, even though it's an exercise of faith. It still works if God foresaw. Well, he said, if Abraham was justified by works, then he could glory. But what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. That's all he did. Faith. And it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You see, God would owe us salvation if he foresaw we were going to be good or believe or repent or do anything else. He says then it would be not grace, but debt. He would owe us something, in this case salvation. Well, it's unconditional election. I, So far we have to agree with the five points, I think, even though we may not as I say, state things the same way always. Uh, 
And uh, I don't recommend, again, you get a sermon on the five points. <laughs> the five points were taken out of the Bible, and they'll come out in your teaching if it's scriptural. If you neglect to preach grace after you've learned what it is, then your, then your ministry isn't a full ministry. And uh, you'll meet opposition to grace. You can talk about grace all you want. You can quote Ephesians 8 and 9, any church in the land. Almost any. But uh, when you start stating what grace is, and we've been several weeks stating what grace is, that it started before the foundation of the world, and we don't have any choice of God, he makes the choice of us. Uh, you'll find out men will oppose grace like they oppose tongues and <laughs> divine healing. They'll let you teach healing even in a Baptist church as long as it's first century healing. And you, you can teach healing in any charismatic circle as long as it isn't divine healing. As long as it's try God and that doesn't work, then don't do anything foolish. You can get away with that. All right, tulip, L, limited atonement. Limited atonement. This is the one that bothers some who uh, have no, no training, real training in the word. Limited atonement. Now, I'm not trying really to deal with all these things. Uh, we've already dealt with them. As I say, we need to know what is the representative view of Calvinistic position. Now, here's the Westminster statement. Limited atonement. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed in Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his Spirit working in due season. They're justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. Now, every word's important. You notice they didn't say kept by the power of God. They said through faith. That's just exactly the way First Peter states it. You're kept by the power of God through faith. You stop having faith, the power of God isn't going to save you or keep you. So if people would take the time to read, really, what Calvin said, they wouldn't resist it. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ effectually called justified, adopted, sanctified, saved, but the elect only. Now these are just statements in a, in a confession of faith. As I say, they're not attempts to justify. If you want to find out what they believe, then... You'll have to read a whole book or join the church and Presbyterian or Reformed or used to be Baptist. Now, Arminianism, we're talking about limited atonement. Arminianism holds that Christ died for all men equally, died for all men alike. And of course, you would, there's probably no one in here to say what's wrong with that. I didn't say anything was. I'm just telling you what Arminianism holds. Christ died for all men alike. Calvinism. Secondly, Calvinism. Calvin would say, while all men are partakers of common grace, while all men are partakers of common grace, that is, God's blessings upon mankind, Christ's atonement was for the elect in particular. So, of course, there's a distinction between common grace and special grace. Calvin held, if election is true, then the atonement would not have application to all men equally, or all men alike. If election is true, then the atonement would not have application to all men alike. Well, you couldn't disagree with that if you, if you admit Election is true, and it's taught from Genesis to Revelation, and very, very strongly in a lot of passages. And there's nothing wrong with that last statement. But we're going to deal with this subject more thoroughly later under the doctrine of calling, so I won't make too many comments. The Arminian, though, would quote Second Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, usward, does not will that any man should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the Arminian 
makes much of 2 Peter 3.9. That the 2 Peter 3.9 shows the atonement includes all men alike because God does not will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if he doesn't will that any should perish, then, then that means all can be saved if they'll believe. I don't know if you've looked at 2 Peter 3.9. I've, uh, years ago, I had a whole book, may still have in my library, that deals with all the Arminian objections. I guess I looked up every scripture of any importance because I've been dealing with this subject for 24 years, but 2 Peter 3.9 doesn't say what they say it says. I don't know if you caught the difference while I was quoting it or not. Misquoting it, I mean. I was purposely misquoting it because they do. They say that the atonement is uh, for everyone because God does not will that any man perish. Is that what it says? What does it say? Not willing. There's a big difference. If God didn't will any man to perish, we'd have universal salvation. They would all be saved if he once willed it. But he's not willing. Like that other scripture in Ezekiel that God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. That's what he's saying here. He's not willing that any should perish. If he willed that they would not perish, then they would all be saved. So words are important. We stress that in everything we've taught. Matthew 21, 22, faith, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, you'll receive. Isn't that what it says? We left out an important word, didn't we? That's the key to receiving. The word we left out is the key. That's why many don't get answers to prayer. No, Jesus said, all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. He didn't say prayer would heal the sick. He said the prayer of faith and so on. So words are important. You should watch them. I don't mean you should build a doctrine on a preposition, but sometimes prepositions are important. Like when it says Jesus was baptized and went up out of the water. Sprinklers have a lot of trouble with that one. (laughs) And the Greek is the word ek, out of, you see. I don't remember how it's translated in English, but... uh, Baptists and uh, others, uh, some who sprinkle and some who pour and so forth. Uh, so there was one good Lutheran. Uh, he's good on everything, most everything with baptism. Good Lutheran wrote commentaries. Good Greek scholar. But when he gets to that, he couldn't deal with it. And so he said, Jesus went down into the water to be sprinkled. <laughs> <laughs> said it was more convenient to be down there. Uh, you know, I didn't have to carry water up to sprinkling. Now, those of you who saw my film from Israel, the baptism, so-called baptism in the Jordan, they stood in a boat, Greek Orthodox Church. Can you imagine that thing? Read the Greek and sprinkling. Greek Orthodox Church. And they stood in the boat, and the uh, pastor, bishop, would take a hyssop, a green sprig of something, dip it in the water, and then sprinkle them in the boat. That was your baptism. <clears throat> so they went out in the middle of the water so they could say they'd been j- baptized in Jordan River. Well, we got that on film. But sometimes uh, prepositions are important. Uh, so we have to keep a balance. Um, here a word is important. God didn't say that he doesn't will for all men uh, to perish. He says he isn't willing. If I don't will for my child to go outside, I'll see that he doesn't, and he better not. (laughs) A lot of times I wasn't willing, and she or he went out anyway, because, you know, I wasn't willing, and I didn't make a real point of it, and I might have just said, it's better if you stay in. See, there's a difference in willing and will. So Calvin said the atonement was sufficient to save all men. Now, that's very important, see? The Arminians couldn't argue with that. That atonement is sufficient to save all men because of the person who, who uh, provided it. But it was limited only in its application. Sufficient for all, limited only in its application. Now... We are going to deal with the extent of the atonement under the doctrine of calling, which comes after the doctrine of election. We're not only predestinated, the Bible says we're called, and we, I mean, 
predestinated, elected, and were called, and then justified. See, we look at all of those uh, doctrines under the doctrine of redemption, biblical doctrine of redemption. So rather than deal with the extent of the atonement here under the five points, I would rather deal with it as a biblical subject under calling. And why there? Well, you'll see when we get there, because the Bible shows there are two callings, a general call to all men and a special call to the elect. Now, it teaches that, and so we're not trying to convince anybody here against their will. Uh, go back at least a year and get the tapes. You'd have to go back at least a year because there's where we started with predestination, God's eternal plan. You would do yourself a disservice to even form an opinion until you at least read the Bible. <laughs> That's right. I've had people debate this and then come with tears in their eyes after they get into the Word. Had one brother in college, came with tears in their eyes. He says it's truth. You know, it really turned some people off that, that they couldn't choose God, that God chooses them. Now that's stating it bluntly because we expect you've been here and we've already said that the Bible, if it stresses one thing, it's whosoever will. And, and if you don't end up in the kingdom, uh, you will be the first to admit it's your fault because you didn't want in the kingdom. But from God's side, after we are saved, we look back and see we were chosen from the foundation of the world. And you don't go preach only the elect can believe because Jesus never preached that. But once they would resist his word, then he would tell them about election. <laughs> but he'd never go preach. He'd offer to all. And he was son of God. And he, how could he be charged with hypocrisy? He was God himself. And yet, he himself would say to those who would oppose his message, he'd say, well, you couldn't come to me anyway except the Father draw you to me. And the Bible, as the scripture says, all that belong to the Father will be taught by the Father and they will come to me. And he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And he goes on to say in the next chapter, which is in the next chapter, it's just the way it's divided up, whosoever thirsts, let him come. Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Well, then he's talking to you. I mean, God isn't going to force men into heaven. They don't want it. They'd be the most miserable people in the world in heaven. We will deal with that, as I say, under calling, the extent of the atonement. We haven't really proven here that the aton atonement is limited, but let's stay with this statement at this point that Calvin said that the atonement was sufficient to save any man who would believe. That would be the whole world because of the infinite merit of Jesus Christ. It's sufficient for all men, but it's efficient only for the elect. I see those things you don't go preach that way. I keep stressing that for these words ministries. You go preaching whosoever will, the sovereignty of God, election, predestination will come out in whosoever will. I mean, you weren't introduced to it in biblical theology in this church. We've preached it from the beginning. But it, it needs to come out in its context and then it's always uh, leavened with grace. Now the unlimited, we said limited atonement is Calvinism, but the unlimited atonement view of Arminianism has a problem with the heathen question. The un unlimited atonement view has a problem with the heathen question. That's the subject we're dealing with right now. We're still under limited atonement. The Arminian, of course, holds to unlimited atonement. And they have a problem with the heathen question. Now, the Reformed Church states it this way. Reformed, Presbyterian, uh, that's the Westminster Confession we're talking about. If election is not true, that's one thing. If the benefits of Christ's death, secondly, are available to all men alike... Then the question is asked, why wouldn't we expect some provision in the plan of God to be made for all men to have heard or to hear at least once? See, you're still back with the problem. Whether you call it election or not, or limited atonement or not, the fact that very few have actually heard, even today, 
There are millions, countless millions who have not heard and will die without hearing. Well, don't, don't sit out there and look at me that way. Uh, most people in India haven't heard. Just India. And I don't know anybody in Russia except a handful out of the, what, how many hundreds of millions, 700 millions? That'll never hear. And before the cross, all the billions who lived and died perished. That's what the Bible says. We've shown that over and over. So you still got the problem whatever you call it, and so Arminianism loses its force in that if election is not true, if, if salvation is available to all men alike, then why wasn't there a provision made by God in his eternal plan to get all men to hear it at least once? And you've got millions today who've not heard and who, most of whom will perish without Christ. So Arminianism loses its effectiveness right at that point. And really, you, you, uh, you can't be an Arminian and be sincere and conscientious and scriptural, even if you don't understand all about the other teachings of scripture in predestination, election, calling, justification, grace, faith. Uh, then you still end up with the same problem. So election isn't true. Well, most are perishing. And so the gospel then is not having much effect. But if election is true, then all that were ordained before the foundation of the world, and they are an innumerable host, they're not a little handful somewhere. Revelation 7 says you can't even count them, the ones that come out of the tribulation who are saved. It doesn't count all down through history. But if election is true, then there will be a people, there will be a people who will be in the family of God and bring glory to his name. And that's why election is true, because without it, there is none seeking after God, none righteous. They've all gone out of the way. No man would ever be saved without election being true. Amen. Now, as I say, we're not trying to prove that point. We've already been many, many weeks on the scriptural point of view there. Calvin would ask the question, why would Christ die for the millions who will never hear? Now, whether or not you would state that he died for the elect only, which the Westminster Confession does, whether you would state it that way, I don't know. But you've got a question to answer. Why would he die for millions who will never hear? Why die for them if they're not going to hear anyway? But if, he, if his atonement is sufficient for all men and is applied to the elect, then, of course, Calvinism is very logical. See, that's logical. I'm not pronouncing on it. I've already given the Bible for weeks. Let you come to your own conclusion. But the Old and New Testament shows that the Arminian position is not uh, scriptural because for centuries no one was saved outside Israel and most of the Israelites eventually were not regenerate. And in the New Testament it shows there were some that the Holy Spirit purposely directed the apostles away from so they wouldn't hear you say, well, eventually they did hear. Well, how do you know? But even if they did, people are dying every day, and so a lot died who didn't get to hear because the Holy Spirit said, don't go over there, don't go over there, go over here. And if you, if you learn how to move with the Spirit, he'll send you with this end-time message. Some places won't let you go others. Now, if you're going to make your own ministry, you'll end up a lot of places you shouldn't be, and you may, you may wonder why you're not bearing fruit, or you may bear some outward fruit, or... Some people sometimes get blessed even when you're out of God's will, but uh, that isn't what we're talking about. That uh, if God's will is going to be done, then everything's going to happen the way that uh, will be most beneficial for the people and bring the most glory to God. Romans 1, three times, says God gave them up. The whole world was given up before Calvary. It says it three times. God gave them up. You ought to read Romans 1 if this is your first trip to the glory bar. Psalm 137 tells us only, only Israel was given the revelation. The rest of the world was in darkness and unbelief. Amos 3.2 says of Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Only you have I known. And to know there means to know savingly, redemptively. In Acts 16.6, that's Old Testament, Acts 16.6, uh, Paul was trying to go to certain places, and when they had gone throughout Phrygia 
and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia Minor. Didn't they need the gospel? Certainly. Multitudes there perished because they didn't hear the word. And after they were come to Mysia, they assayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit allowed them not. And so they ended up coming west, and that's why we have the gospel and not the Turks and the Chinese and so on. Why? Matthew 11. For it seemed good, Father, in thy sight. Praise God. Hallelujah. It seemed good. That's the good way that they come west. So, so don't be afraid to say what the Bible says. Don't go preaching tulip, but uh, <laughs> if you stay with the word, you'll find out that all he did was put it in a logical order. And, uh, well, total inability, unconditional election, limited atonement, there's grace. You wouldn't, have, you wouldn't necessarily have to have it in that order. I was thinking maybe it was even in a logical order to spell tulip, but really it doesn't matter. But uh, that starts with uh, your inability going through the atonement, the election, the atonement, the bestowal of grace, and your perseverance to the end, which is uh, the purpose of grace. Why bestow grace upon people are not going to endure? Now, this isn't all we have to say about perseverance. Let's wait till we get there. All right. Irresistible grace, sometimes called efficacious grace, or effective grace, means it affects the purpose for which it's given. The fourth point of the five points of Calvinism is efficacious grace, irresistible grace. And uh, see if I can find a quote here from um, Westminster Confession. This is really a good book for the whole subject of predestination election by a contemporary writer, but you can't have my copy. I can let you get the publisher, and if you want a good book, and you can order you one. Efficacious Grace is the title of this chapter, and he quotes the Westminster Confession. All those whom God has predestinated unto life, and those only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of the state of death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. It's all there if you would study each of those uh, statements of faith. In some of the catechisms, uh, they, like the Baptist catechism, will say the same thing as this. We'll give you scriptures after each of those statements. And uh, you'll see that uh, that's a biblical statement, the whole thing. That if it's grace, then he bestows his grace, but not in such a way that he takes away our, the free exercise of our own wills. He says, he effectually draws us to Christ, the Father does, by his grace, yet so that we come most freely, we've been made willing by his grace. That's what grace is for. I mean, if it's grace, it's saving grace. If it's saving grace, then it will save. Well, the Arminian replies with Titus 2.11. What about Titus 2.11? See, that statement said that grace is, a, is applied to the elect only, and it will produce the desired result, that those who receive grace will believe by the free exercise of their own wills. And that's what grace does. Titus 2.11 for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So, the conclusion by the Arminian is that the atonement, therefore, is unlimited. Grace is unlimited, and it's entirely up to the sinner to respond. That he can cooperate with grace, and that's why it's bestowed. 
Well, again, it needs to be pointed out that Titus 2.11 doesn't say that. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. It does not say it's bestowed, which is what election teaches, but that it has appeared, that is, through the preaching of the gospel. Wherever the gospel is preached, the grace of God is appearing, you see. It's being made manifest. So again, it's important to see what he said. Secondly, obviously we can't take the verse literally that it's appeared to all men because we know from history and contemporary experience that it hasn't appeared to all men. Millions, there are millions to whom it's not appearing today and countless millions down through history to whom it's never appeared. A number of times in Scripture when it says all, it doesn't mean all. That's why, again, you have to be an honest interpreter. It says all men came out of Jerusalem to be baptized of John the Jordan. Then goes on to tell you that some refused. <laughs> Pharisees and scribes. They didn't all come out. A lot of people stayed home. But it meant just people were coming from everywhere. And uh, obviously sometimes when it says all, you have to use common sense. And all here appeared to all men means now Gentiles. It's going all over the world, you know, into Rome and to Europe and uh, places where before it was just Israel. All the stress for a while was Israel, Israel, Israel. Jesus said, I've been sent only to the house of Israel. That had to be done first. So the grace of God has not appeared to all men even today, but it's certainly all in the sense it has gone out to the four corners of the world. Then the context tells you upon whom grace is bestowed, those that respond in this way with obedience, teaching us that grace teaches us that we are to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, we're to live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present world, looking for that blessed hope. So those are the ones upon whom it's bestowed. And so the Reformed doctrine of efficacious grace, effective grace, holds that grace would not be bestowed upon sinners in the hope that they might respond to God's offer of pardon, but that grace is for the purpose of enabling the person to respond. That saving grace is never bestowed upon all men with the hope that some might believe but that the purpose of bestowing grace is to enable them to believe. Really, that's what grace is. Saving grace results in salvation. If it's saving grace, it'll save. Or you've got to call it something else. You've got to call it an offer. An offer of salvation isn't the bestowal of grace. When grace is bestowed, the person responds. That's the Bible teaching. As I say, most people have no conception of what grace is all about. It's just some abstraction set forth in Ephesians 2, by grace are you saved. Acts 18.27 shows that to be true, that grace produces the result that it was intended to produce, namely the salvation of the sinner. Acts 18.27, and when he had... He was disposed to pass into Achaia. The brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. Amen. You believe through grace. Take with that Acts 13, 48. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. As many as received grace believed. That's what those two passages say. Tulip is easier to remember, but efficacious is a better word than irresistible. If you ever do any real study in this area, you'll, you'll find people are offended by even terms that are used in Calvinistic circles. So irresistible, I never, I never use irresistible grace. I say effective grace. That's what the Bible teaches. Irresistible, like, well, I couldn't resist if I wanted to, gives a wrong impression but it's always your free will. Grace enables you to respond. It's like you're sitting in a dark room and God walks in and you don't know the way out. Mm -hmm. And God is passing by and just walks in one day and throws a light switch. 
he doesn't compel you to go out the door and find, get back into circulation or find life and hope. He just enables you now to find the door, which is Jesus. That's enabling grace. That's efficacious grace. Uh, irresistible doesn't bother me because when God bestows it, it is irresistible. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the term, but you have to be careful. You have to, uh, a lot of times, meet people where they're at in their thinking. Right. So if you're in denominational churches, speak about when you're baptized in the Spirit, it gives you a new language. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what the Greek word means. And it's translated that in, in Acts 2 that way. It's translated once tongues, the same word is translated language. And that's what the word means. Tongue is a figure of speech. That isn't what the word means in Greek. It means a language. And it means figuratively the tongue. Like the English tongue, German tongue, Italian tongue. Nothing wrong with it if you say it that way. But uh, I've always been on guard in denominational circles. I generally state it in a way they couldn't argue with it because then you can show them Acts 2 and they can see these are languages you speak, not meaningless gibberish. The best language sounds like gibberish to the untrained ear. Right. Ata meraber ivrit. At meraberet ivrit. Well, Hebrew students would probably guess at what I said, but the rest of you, it was mumbo-jumbo. <laughs> but it's perfectly good Hebrew. Mashlomka. <laughs> Mashlomek. I said to the men and the women, how are you? Tov meo. See, they're talking in tongues. <laughs> now, that's true. They are talking in tongues, but that isn't supernatural. We know what we're saying. And... Uh, I remembered enough of my German to greet, I uh, saw her, oh yeah, over there. I uh, greeted the sister from Germany over there with what I remembered. I remembered a couple of words, sauerkraut and... <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't lay that one on her. I said, sprechen der Deutsch, and she... <laughs> I said, do you speak German? Naturally she does, but that's all I could think of. Often. <laughs> but you see, until I told some of you what that was, that was just gibberish. And so when we here in the barn or all over the world speak in tongues, we're speaking other languages, but it doesn't mean anything to the untrained ear. I've recognized Hebrew, oh, I don't know how many times. Good Hebrew. One woman I prayed for in Louisville couldn't... Well, she couldn't speak good English, but when she received the baptism, just perfect Hebrew, and very slowly and distinctly. And another brother came up, wanted to know what... Uh, he says, I just, when I received the baptism, all I got was two words, Abimelech. Abimelech. And I just said it over and over. I said, well, you're saying Abimelech, that's Hebrew. And uh, then I interpret what the word meant for him in Hebrew. So Hebrew uh, is recognizable. We recognize people who speak the languages. We recognize several out of this body. That is, several who had spoken other languages. But if you're in a church that doesn't understand all that, I'm saying you meet them on their level. And that isn't a derogatory statement with the truth of grace or election or anything else presented in a way that you don't purposely offend people just because you could. <laughs> you could state the truth and be offensive with it unnecessarily. But let the Holy Spirit guide you. Sometimes that may be the way he wants it. And some of you may not even be able to understand that, but sometimes that's the way it is. That's the way it is. And you could find examples of that in Scripture. All right, and fifthly, Perseverance of the Saints. 182, uh, I've got a page marked here for Westminster Confession. This is perseverance of the saints. That means the security of the believer, that the saint will persevere to the end and be saved, is the point. They whom God hath accepted in his beloved, affectionately called and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally 
nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Or in other words, now he interprets, in other words, we believe that those who once become true Christians cannot totally fall away and be lost, and that while they may fall into sin temporarily, they will be eventually, they will eventually return and be saved. All right, the Reformed Doctrine. Now, Arminian theology keeps believers in a state, constant state of doubt and fear as to the present standing and final state. Arminian theology, which teaches you can be saved and then be lost, and stresses that, keeps people in a state of fear, doubt and fear as to the final outcome. Oh, I have dealt with so many. It's pathetic. Some you can't even give any assurance from the Word of God. Every sin, every failure, down at the altar, repenting, getting saved all over. And uh, some are backslidden permanently and useless to the kingdom of God because they think they're lost. And they're waiting to feel like saved again. Pentecostals are noted for that. And without mentioning denominations, uh, there are a number of them that uh, teach the insecurity of the believer rather than the security. Well... We've got a tape on the unpardonable sin, and I'll say, make a statement that I made there that Hebrews 6 shows you, and you ought to tell these people that are up and down, saved and lost, lost and saved every other week or month or from one revival to another, that Hebrews 6 says if you do fall away and you're lost, then you're permanently lost because you can't renew yourself again to repentance. At least they ought to know that's in the Bible. So what is the actual fact is they're backslidden. If they're actually saved, they're backslidden. Now there's more to say than that, but I want to say that. Now that's the Arminian view and an answer to it. But on the other hand, it's not correct as hyper-Calvinists teach to stress once saved, always saved. Not under law, but grace. Therefore, I can't be judged for my sin. I can be chastened, but never forsaken. And uh, that ministers a complacency to people that think they can live the way they want and still be saved. So we need to remind them of Hebrews 6 and of Hebrews 10, dealing with apostasy, with Matthew 12, dealing with blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, with Matthew 24, 13, that says, He that endures to the end will be saved. You see, the enduring is a part of the saving as well as the believing. So we need to keep a scriptural balance on this subject. That we shouldn't minister fear to people. A person ought to know his say, he's saved. He ought to have that assurance. But he shouldn't be complacent and think he can live as he pleases because he says, well, I'm not under law but grace. Romans 6 answers that. He said, if you serve sin, then you're under death. We need to keep a scriptural balance, we're saying. And so remember that it is the New Testament, it's the Bible, it's Jesus who gives us the assurance of security. Let me give you a few passages on security, uh, not dealing thoroughly with the subject, but just to show you security of a believer is taught, perseverance of the saints is taught. John 10:27 to 31. See, we didn't make these truths up. John 10:27 to 31. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Well, right away he's talking about sheep who obey and follow, right? He isn't talking about people who says, I'm under grace, and that's all that's important. And I give unto them, those who hear my voice and follow me, I give to them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. Now, man, man is not in the Greek. Uh, you, man isn't the one to be afraid of, but you need to be concerned about the devil. So he says, neither shall anything, anyone, man or devil, pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now, if that isn't eternal security, I don't know what is. How could it be any plainer? But he's the same one that started out by saying, my sheep obey me. And these are the ones that no one can take out of my hand. So the balance is keeping all of what he said together. Now we know that uh, 
great passage in, uh, in Romans 8. And remember, Romans 8 deals with the election and predestination. Romans 8, 29, For whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. Well, verse 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God who did the justifying. Who is he that condemns? Verse 35, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? Why, no. Verse 37, All these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If that isn't security, that makes me feel secure. <laughs> Even though I know that First Peter said I've got to make my calling and election sure by the way I live, but if I do what God said, that's security. Second Timothy 1.12 is security and perseverance. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know who am I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed him unto him against that day. Well, we even sing about that. I am persuaded he's able to, he's able to keep that which I have committed, my soul, my life, my salvation. First Peter 1, 3 to 5 teaches security. Oh, there are many, many passages. These are some of the more outstanding ones. First Peter 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Through faith, of course, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. He says we are kept by the power of it. Thank God we're kept by his power. Amen. Nothing can separate us. You can separate yourself. Hebrews 6 and 10 says you can, but you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> Grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30, that's another one. You're sealed. Well, the balance between the warnings against apostasy and perseverance of the saints is probably most clearly seen in Hebrews 10, the balance between the two. Just like in John 10, Hebrews 10 shows the balance. There's a warning, but there's an assurance. Hebrews 10, 23, Let us hold fast to our confession of faith without doubting, for he is faithful who promised. Let us consider one another to provoke one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see that day approaching. Now here's the warning. If we sin willfully, he's talking about apostasy here, going back, denying Christ. Some of the Jews were tempted to do it because of the great persecution. Some did. But if we sin willfully, after that we have re received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Well, of how much more, how much sore punishment suppose you that he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He's talking about a person who apostatizes. Counts it as a whole unholy thing and has despised, done despite to the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. But, that isn't all he says. But call to remembrance the former days, you know, when they first got saved and walked with Christ and rejoicing in their salvation, which after you were illuminated, you know, by grace and the gospel, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by the reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. He's talking about the persecution they went through and still held fast their confession. 
for you had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your own goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your faith, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of endurance, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Amen. For you let, yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now verse 39 is important. But we are not of them who draw back into sin, into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Amen. So after the warning comes the assurance that we are going to be saved. So there's the balance. The warning, but closes with an encouragement. So the doctrine of perseverance doesn't really stand by itself. Uh, if election and predestination are true, and they are, as the scriptures clearly show, then this is the logical conclusion that the saints would persevere to the end. Because the warning is there, because some didn't persevere, they have and always will be in a very small minority who didn't persevere. I mean, of, of those who confess Christ. But the warning is real, and so perseverance are for those who obey.